I'll be honest, I'm not sure how to start this story off. The title is probably what made you click on this. After all, how scary could my grandfather being a janitor be? But that isn't what this story is about. This is about my grandfather who uncovered something big during his time as a custodian at a government facility near Seattle, Washington. I guess that's where we'll start off. My grandpa started working at this facility after the Korean War. It was 1957 and he was 24 years old with no life experiences other than war. So he became a custodian. He didn't mind the work and he was good at it, so he stayed working there. He didn't retire until 1997 at the age of 67. I didn't see much of my grandpa growing up, mostly because he had gone off to live in the middle of nowhere. My dad never told me why. He's 86 now. He outlived his only son, with my dad passing away in 2014 of a respiratory issue. I've seen him a couple times. He was at my father's funeral. He apologized for not being around when I was a kid. I told him I didn't mind. But that's how I got back in touch with him. After my dad's funeral, we stayed in touch. He invited me out to stay at his cabin on McConaughey Lake in Nebraska. 102 people live near the lake. That's it. I accepted it. I planned to stay with the old man for a little less than a week before returning home. I was up in Boston at the time, so the flight down wasn't horrible. I flew into Omaha and then had to drive the rest of the way out to his cabin. When I arrived, it actually looked sort of nice. Not many trees, but the house itself was pretty nice. Strange because I didn't think he made much money. Two-story cabin with a porch and a deck. He had an above-ground pool in the back. It was actually kind of awesome. Anyway, although I was impressed by the house itself, it was really my grandpa who was the best part. I forgot how cool he was, but he was a super badass in Korea, came home and got a job with the CIA. Well, kinda. He was a janitor, but whatever. It was a good job. He was a lifelong outdoorsman. He had all sorts of stuffed fish and animals in his house. It's creepy when it's too much, but these were actually pretty cool. But anyway, he greeted me. He was old, so he was a little slower, had trouble on steps and stuff. So I met him on his deck. He was really excited I was there. He brought me inside and gave me a proper tour of the place. He told me he was going to grill steaks for dinner and then we could do whatever. It honestly sounded great. I just wanted to be around the guy. I hadn't had a grandfatherly experience. The first three days of being in Nebraska were great. We went fishing, not in the lake, but in a pond he knew nearby. He said it was a better spot than the popular local ones. But the fourth day was odd. It started like the others. Grandpa made me breakfast, which was the same as every other day, bacon and eggs. He's a man of tradition. But then he told me he had to do something. So he left. He hadn't left any of the other days. But whatever, I'm sure he was busy. So I just went about my day. About four hours later, he still wasn't back. I was bored, so I figured... I'd take a ride into town and go into some of the stores to pick up a souvenir to take home. I took the keys to his pickup truck. My rental was still there, but he had two trucks and I really wanted to get into the spirit of Nebraska. The truck bed was locked. I was just gonna see what was in there and the top of it was secured on tightly. I tried to unlock it with the actual key. You know, like how all cars work but the key didn't work. Whatever. There were no stores. I guess that explained Grandpa telling me he ordered everything he owned on the internet or made it himself. When I was driving home, I actually saw another car, a pickup truck on this dirt road. I was excited, 
but I just kept motoring on a little ways down the road and I was making this really sharp turn. Looks like you're driving into nothing and then there's just a turn. Anyway, the guy rear-ended me. I hopped out and talked to him. He said he knew my grandpa and that it wouldn't be a problem. I took down his information on a business card that was in the truck. He drove off and I went to look at the damage again. It really wasn't bad. Well, except for the lock on the truck bed, which was totally busted open. It was locked for a reason. I shouldn't look at this. It's not mine. It's not right. That's what I was thinking. But I opened the back and slid the top off. Inside were two crates of files. The top two labeled Radar Questioning 4 and Roswell Files. Also in the bed was a bag. I unzipped it to find it was filled with stacks of hundred dollar bills. None of that grabbed my attention as much as the guns. So many guns. Listen, I'm not anti-gun. I think people should be able to exercise their second amendment to a certain extent. But this was enough guns to make a marine blush. Why would he need all this? Some of the guns just weren't for hunting. It was a good assortment of rifles, handguns, shotguns. But next to all of this was another duffel bag. I unzipped it, and inside was a 22 Browning machine gun. Littered around the bed were also dozens and dozens of ammo boxes. I closed the bag with the gun, closed the bag with the money, and just stopped to think for a second. I didn't read the files. I wanted to, but he could already be back at the house, and I didn't want to take extra time, so I put the lid back on the bed and closed it up. The lock was broken. I drove home and parked it. He was already back. I walked inside, and he had brought inside one of his packages and was cutting it open. You took the truck? His voice was kind. The voice of an old man, so sort of weak and raspy, but kind, and I loved hearing him talk. Yeah, just into Lemoyne to see if there was anything, but it doesn't look like much. He laughed. There are 102 people here. They're not setting up much of anything. Grandpa, I should tell you, there was an accident. That really sharp turn we took to get to the fishing spot? I was taking that, and one of the guys that lives close to you rear-ended the truck. He said you guys had settled something similar before, but I took his information down just to be safe. I handed him the restaurant business card I had written the information on to my grandpa. That's Wade Presson. I knew his dad too. Good family. No problem. Was anything damaged? I mean, is the truck okay? Truck's fine. Just the lock on the truck bed got busted. That's the only thing. I turned to look at his response, and his face turned pale white. Did you open the bed? I nodded yes. I don't like that you invaded my privacy, but I feel like I should explain what's in the truck bed. That's my apocalypse stuff. He sighed. What? I laughed at his explanation. We all have guilty pleasures, and mine is doomsday prepping. Those guns are for fighting people who might want what's mine, and the files are recycled. What's written on them isn't what's in them. Those files have plans for farms or traps. I guess I knew a lot of Midwesterners liked doomsday prepping, but to hear it from Grandpa was strange. I just accepted it, told him that it was kind of interesting, and that was the end of that. Something still didn't feel right, but I wasn't going to argue with the guy. He cooked dinner, and I was in bed by 10 o'clock. He went to sleep pretty early. That night, as I was falling asleep, the box of files in the truck just kept chewing at me. So, I got up and walked outside to check on it. As I got outside, I could hear a rustling coming from the cars. I pulled out my phone flashlight and began walking over. 
I figured it was just an animal. But as I got over, it was Grandpa cleaning everything out of the back of the car. The guns, the files, all of it. He was loading everything into the back of his other truck. He saw me. Shit, is all I could think. Ah, oh, hey Grandpa. I heard something out here, but I guess it's just you. Why are you doing this now? I was now very suspicious of him, but I couldn't let on. But what was I going to say to him? I know something's weird. I'm going to take the truck into town to get it fixed. I'm just cleaning it out. Who takes their truck to get cleaned at almost 11 o'clock? I nodded, but didn't say anything. I just turned back, going into the house. I knew something was wrong. I could feel it. Was Grandpa a bank robber? Was that why he was so reclusive? Or was I being dumb and he really was just a good-intentioned old man with some strange hobbies? I went back to bed. I woke up at about 4 in the morning to the sound of someone talking into their phone. It was Grandpa, in the living room, talking to someone on his cell phone. I cracked my door open just slightly so I could hear what he was saying. He knows something is wrong. He saw the stuff in my truck. No, I don't think he looked at the files. Well, we're going hunting tomorrow, so I can sort it out then. Yeah, I'll call you later. Bye. He hung up the phone, and I heard him start to walk towards his room, which was directly across the hall from mine. I jumped back into my bed, pulled the covers over myself, and pretended to be fast asleep. I heard him enter my room, the creak of my door being pushed open, and a few steps across the floor. He must have been standing right at the end of my bed, staring at me. Twenty minutes passed, and I heard nothing. No footsteps walking away. Not the door closing. Nothing. I figured he had walked out and just not made that much of a sound. But I was far too scared to look. The thought of this man, who I believed to be hiding a secret from me, just standing over me, looming over me, it was unsettling to say the least. But eventually, my fake sleep turned into real sleep. I'm really not sure how. I was terrified the entire time. When I woke up, my door was closed. If he had left, I would have heard it. He was there the entire time. This sent a chill up my spine. Why had he done that? Why would he watch me do nothing but sleep for so long? Surely, there had to be a perfectly reasonable explanation for this. When I went into the kitchen, he was holding one of his rifles. I stepped back. Well, this is it. I'm about to be offed by my own grandfather. That was all I could think. Hey Jimbo, grab a rifle out the safe and get in the truck. We're gonna go back some white tails. I smiled at him, a disingenuous smile, but I was praying he would be convinced I knew nothing. Sounds great. I walked to the basement where the safe was open. Even more guns sat inside. His collection was nuts. I grabbed one of the rifles and checked that it was loaded. It was. I ascended the stairs where my grandfather stood with a sweet smile on his face, his rifle slung over his back. He was wearing a whole hunting outfit. Vest, boots, jeans, hats, glasses. I mean, he was really ready. We drove out into the middle of nowhere. The drive wasn't that long, but it felt like forever. Every time I looked away from him, I felt an eerie sense that I was being watched. But every time I looked back, he was staring perfectly forward at the road ahead. Eventually, we reached the spot that he had mentioned previously. Said there were lots of deer around. We walked into the wilderness for a few minutes. Me in front of him. We just followed the trail. That was until we came upon a cave. It was a straight drop, twenty feet down. Grandpa, what cave is? 
I heard him cocking his rifle and turned around only to see him aiming the gun at me. In a quick motion, I lifted my own rifle. We both stood silent, both with guns pointed at one another. I broke the silence. What the hell is going on? He shook his head. He looked conflicted, like he was unsure what he was going to do. James, I'm not a janitor. I cleaned up messes with the CIA, but it wasn't trash. My job was to cover up anomalies caused by ultra-terrestrial beings. That's where the money came from. That's what those files are for. Bullshit. No way. There's no way the meek old man in front of me used to hunt aliens. So what? You're the man in black? He shook his head. They handle extraterrestrials. Me and my division were ultra-terrestrial. I shook my head. What the fuck does that even mean? He seemed upset that I had cursed at him. It means that the anomalies I cleaned up were caused by beings from another place. A place where the rules of existence are different. And when these things bleed into our world, they cause problems. I wasn't satisfied with that answer. Did my dad know? My dad never liked his father. I wanted to know if this is why. Of course he did. Why do you think he didn't want me near you? I was dangerous. I couldn't help but chuckle. Were dangerous? You're pointing a gun at me, Grandpa. He sighed. I'm sorry, James. He lifted his rifle, so it was in line with my head. I pulled the trigger first, but I was met with a disheartening click. I removed the firing pins from all my other guns. In that moment of my confusion, he pulled the trigger. A bullet cut through my side, knocking me backwards. I plummeted. I felt my back break as I hit the stone floor of this cave. The sounds I made, begging for my grandfather for help. But I heard his boots start to walk back down the trail. Looking around me, I could see the completely decomposed remains of at least four people. That's how many skulls I saw. From the darkness of the cave, I could hear the growling of a monster grow stronger and louder. And in that moment, I knew why my grandfather had moved to McConaughey Lake. I wrote that in 2016. I don't remember what happened next, but I woke up in Arizona, a mile outside of Phoenix. I couldn't move. The sun scorched my skin. Local police found me and brought me to a hospital where I spent the next eight months. I was paralyzed from the waist down because of the incident, and I hadn't seen my grandfather for two years. When in 2018, he came to me. But that's a story for a different time. I'm sure this is an unsatisfactory ending for most of you. But hopefully, part two can shed more light on what exactly was in the cave and what kind of beings my grandfather was dealing with during his time in the CIA.